In 1994, 27-year-old R. Kelly allegedly marries 15-year-old singer Aaliyah in a secret ceremony. The marriage is reportedly annulled less than a year later. From 1996 to 2002, during his marriage to Andrea, a marriage in which she says he physically abused her, three other women sue R. Kelly for alleged inappropriate sexual contact with teenagers. He reportedly settles with each of them. In 2008, R. Kelly stands trial for 14 counts of child pornography related to sexually explicit photos and a video of an allegedly underage girl. In sum, he's accused of performing disturbing acts, including urinating on her. He's acquitted of all charges. 2017, eight years after his divorce from Andrea, a report in BuzzFeed claims that Kelly engaged in controlling behavior, including holding several women against their will. He and women he lives with deny the allegation. This summer, he addressed many of the controversies swirling around him in a 19-minute long song called I Admit. Now I don't know what else to say except I'm so falsely accused. Tell me, how can you judge when you never walked in my shoes? R. Kelly was this fun, laughing, loving guy. But Robert is the devil. Is the devil. Is the devil. R. Kelly is at the top of the charts, but he may be in for a fall. He was arrested today on 21 counts of child pornography. Kelly is accused of videotaping himself having sex with an underage girl. Taking advantage of minors will not be tolerated. Jurors found him not guilty on all charges. Robert has said all along he would be clear to these terrible charges. Lisa Martinez, Zosante, Lisa Van Allen, Faith Rogers, Kitty Jones. I am Drea Kelly. I dated R. Kelly for two and a half years, almost 13 years, married almost 10. And I had an on and off relationship with R. Kelly for 11 months. Seems like I just blinked and time went by, but yes, 13 years of my life with him. I was 17, I was a child. He took away my innocence. He took me off the path that I was on. Um, he changed my life forever. Ari Kelly is this loving, fun guy that everybody see. But Robert, 
he's a devil. You pretty much had to have permission to do whatever from eating to bathing. That's who he is. When he was about to go there, when it was becoming abusive, his pupils would dilate and his shoulders would almost round. And I used to say he started to look like a cobra to me. If I didn't get out of there, I was going to either end up killing myself or he was going to end up killing me. So, Standing on a balcony contemplating suicide. And that's when I knew I'm done. I was only 19, 20 at the time, and what I was dealing with was way over my head and abusive. What made me decide to end my marriage to Robert on top of the abuse was my children. I think the nail in the coffin for me, ironically, was thinking of seeing my daughter in a coffin because so many women lose their lives to abusers. And I thought, what if one day she ends up with a man like this and he kills her? But that's what you taught her, Drea. She grew up in a house seeing her dad be abusive to her mom, and I was done. I don't know where the strength came from, um, but it did, thankfully. Once the story came out, just things have been really tough for me because, like you say, you're reliving this trauma. For a long time, you'll blame yourself. What could I have done to prevent this? And then when you find out it wasn't just you, not only is it infuriating, but it's like, this guy's really sick. It's not just about Ari Kelly, it's about any other perpetrators like him and for other women that's dealing with situations like the other women and myself have gone through. I, myself, kind of want to be the support for other girls. It's hard to look at another victim. I mean, it's just, for me, it's hard to because I know what I went through. And when I hear their stories, it's just like his behavior has gotten worse. It's quite emotional for me. At the same time that I feel like I'm helping save lives, I'm also stepping out and speaking forward against the father of my children. But I thank God when I look back because now my children are at an age that they can understand it and handle it. Sorry, I don't need to get emotional, they're my biggest supporters. They're the ones who tell me, Mom, you gotta get out of bed today. They're the ones who tell me, Mom, tell your story because you're gonna save somebody's life. This is gonna crush their world because they have to come to the reality that this monster they describe is also your father. But my kids also told me, but Mom, the hero everybody sees is our mom. I'm just so angry that the music industry has overlooked his predatory behavior. It's gone on for way too long. His victims are minorities. People care a lot less. It seems like because who he is and the black community is always supporting him, they just keep thinking that we're doing it because we want money or we felt like he left us and so we, it's, trying, it's about revenge. It's not about revenge. It's not just about taking him down. It's about helping everybody else heal from this. And of course I would love to see him in handcuffs, but that's gonna take time. There's something deeper than him just needing to go to jail. You know, confess to what he's done. I don't even care about an apology. I just want him to own up to the things that he's done, admit to the person that he is and get some help. The best advice I could give anyone is to love yourself first. It's never too late to leave. Just know that there's an end to it. You can leave and you can get out and you can survive it. There is a life after abuse. <laughs> In 2002, Kelly was indicted for possession of child pornography after a tape surfaced that appeared to show him having sex with a teenage girl. A jury found him not guilty in 2008 after deciding they could not identify the girl. For many years, Kelly reached out-of-court settlements with women who accused him of abuse, some who signed non-disclosure agreements that kept them from speaking out about the allegations. However, a, however, after a 2017 BuzzFeed article reported R. Kelly is keeping women against their will in an abusive cult, survivors and parents of victims have come forward with new allegations about his sexual, mental, and physical abuse. This is Angelo and Alex. Clary, parents of Asriel Clary, who met R. Kelly when she was 17. 
and the way they had to exit was through the back. So during that time, we was waiting and waiting and waiting and kind of getting a little nervous. Went to the corner where the VIP was, and then that's where she exited at, from the um, back side of the stage. He told us that he had asked her to hear us sing. He liked it, so he gave her a number to contact him. Andrea was in the 11th grade. We didn't find out right away, but she was secretly, I guess, calling him and texting him and had been talking to him on the phone. One day, the time that she's supposed to be home, I called and she wasn't home yet. Finally, we get a phone call. She finally called me and said, oh, I'm at a hotel in Kissimmee meeting with R. Kelly. How and why, like, did this happen? Like. I was really shocked. Azriel Clary met the singer back in 2015. She was 17 at the time. Her parents claim that Kelly promised to help launch her singing career. They say they have learned since then that his real interest in their words was a little more sinister. I spoke with them yesterday about how this all started, and they say that just three days after meeting R. Kelly, their daughter went to a hotel to meet him without their permission. They were furious and went knocking on hotel doors to find her. What she said was, this was an audition. audition. Why wouldn't you trust me? Y'all mm -hmm. would think I would put myself in a, a predicament and not call y'all if something wasn't right. She's saying you're messing up my chances. Exactly. And that's exactly what she so said. What this she... is my opportunity. This is my big break. Tempers eventually cooled. And the Clarys say they actually developed a professional relationship with R. Kelly over the next few months, even pitching various business deals, all of which he rejected. What's going on? The Clarys say the singer had his own proposal. Let Azriel join him on his tour full time. He flew us into Chicago. We sat with him in his studio. We met with him. And he basically told us, you know, yeah, I'm starting tour. You know, basically, y'all need to make a decision. Azriel had dreams of becoming a singer, according to her parents, who say she dealt with personal struggles, including a suicide attempt following a bad breakup. That was before she met R. Kelly. She eventually gave her parents an ultimatum. She says, if you don't allow me to go, I will try to take my own life again, or I will run away. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't want to call her bluff on it, because I know she just attempted this previously. I'm thinking in my head, she only got three more months. She's going to be 18, so she can do what she want. And she really carry out this. And then now I'm living with regret for the rest of my life. From the outside looking in, guys, people will still say, you're allowing your 17-year-old daughter, who at the time is underage, mm -hmm to go with R. Kelly. The perception is that he preys on underage girls. Did that give you any kind of pause whatsoever? That gave me pause. I mean, it gave me awareness, but you talk about a young lady that's raised by two parents going to So you're to saying you trusted her? I didn't trust him. What I trusted was I raised my child right. I trust my daughter was, will be honest with us. And this was strictly her music. R. Kelly had a platform, as big as music can ever give somebody. I didn't see the label stop supporting them. And you told me that you saw him working with other young women. Yes. Last week, Kelly blamed Azriel's parents for their own estrangement. What kind of father, what kind of mother will sell their daughter to a man? Three months before Azriel turned 18, the Clary signed a letter giving their consent for her to go on Kelly's tour and stay with a woman named Valerie Denise Payton. Who is Valerie Payton? It ain't R. Kelly. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not Robert Kelly. But does she work with R. Kelly? She posed to work for the label. We found out later on that she works for R. Kelly. But at the she time you signed this, you thought she was... He told us it was he, someone was affiliated from, with the music label. From Sony. Okay. Correct. Correct. So you thought she would be a chaperone Correct. for your daughter. That's what she was supposed to have been. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we found out later there was no truth in that. I think it, in retrospect, many of these parents were too trusting. Michael Avenatti is representing the Clarys. He claims R. Kelly used his celebrity status to manipulate the families and the women. If what you're alleging is true, how is he able to get away with this for this period of time? He surrounded himself with a bunch of people, a bunch of yes men and women, that would provide assurance and comfort to these parents relating to the fact that their daughters were going to be safe, that their daughters were going to be looked after, that all of this was legit, that R. Kelly could be trusted. From people in the inside, some of the other victims that we talked to, they all said that, that the girls have to prove their loyalty to him by any means necessary. He's the problem. 
He don't have a sickness. He made a choice. And this is what you guys fail to realize. It was not just R. Kelly that was doing this. It was, it was not only just him and his handlers and his cohorts and who, whatever you want to call him. It was my daughter, it too. It was also our daughter, because yeah. you have to understand, she was lying and duping us and pulling the wool over our house from the beginning. When you look back on it, what do you think of the mistakes that you made? Do you take any responsibility take for the situation responsibility. that you're in? We, 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 never, we never denied responsibility. I feel like I failed my daughter because I should have saw different signs. I should have saw, saw the change in my baby girl. How do you think this story is going to end with your daughter? How I want to see it end, I want to see my daughter leave. Of course, but how do you, are you concerned about how it could end? Are you... I've heard, like, a suicide pact. You know, I know my a daughter... A suicide pact? Yes, I've heard all kinds of stuff. So, you know, I That really... gives me chills, Alice. It should give you chills. It because does. Because the difference is our daughter had experience with trying to do it. See, everybody else can talk, it, but it's nothing like... See a father coming in the house and seeing your daughter submerged in water and you have to pick her up and try to get her to the hospital. See, I've been through that. So why everybody else may take this lightly and, oh, they just throwing something out there. It's real life for us. Um, this mm -hmm. series is just heartrending, horrifying. Um, talk for people who aren't so familiar with R. Kelly. Tell us who he is and when the allegations started surfacing, why you're so deeply concerned about him and have really co-founded a movement against him. Well, R. Kelly is a um, internationally recognized singer, songwriter, producer, um, who's had a number of hits um, over the last couple of decades um, that have cemented him in a lot of people's mind as the king of R&B. Um, he is beloved in the African-American community um, for some of the more inspiring and uplifting songs that he's written, um, like I Believe I Can Fly and Step in the Name of Love. I mean, those are um, staple songs um, at African-American weddings and graduations. And so he's, he's very steeped in the culture. Um, I first heard the allegations um, R. Kelly, when short I was for maybe Robert 14, Kelly. 15, around Aaliyah's age, about that marriage. Um, and I can remember, you know, thinking that was outrageous from, you know, a kid's point of view. Um, and then many years passed, and I didn't hear anything else really, I, you know, going on with my life, go to college, you know, just wrapped up in other circles. Um, and so hadn't heard anything else until June, I believe it was, of 2017, when the allegations came out about the what the media was calling sex cults in his home in Johns Creek, which is right outside of Atlanta. Um, and at the time, I was sitting in my office, and I, you know, heard this on the news, and I just did a Google search. I was like, you know, what is this? I haven't heard anything about R. Kelly in years. Um, and when I did that Google search, I found article after article after article after article um, about all the allegations, all the court cases um, that had come up since Aaliyah. We're talking about 25 years worth of women coming out and saying that this person abused me, um, this person is violent, um, they started a sexual relationship with me when I was underage, um, and they were asking for the community's help and were being largely ignored. Um, and I just became incensed. I mean, I, I really just sat at my, my desk in my office um, fuming, like, you know, how dare we let this go on for 25 years um, at the expense of dozens upon dozens of young black women. Um, so I, I didn't know what to do. I'm not an activist by any kind of training, um, but I just was like, you know, I'm just going to start a petition, a really humble petition to try to get him off of Atlanta radio. Atlanta especially cannot afford to support um, child molesters. We have a huge child sex trafficking problem in Atlanta. Um, and I just was like, we just can't, we, we all know this to be true, regardless of the fact that we have to say alleged in front of all of these accusations. Everybody saw that tape of him sexually degrading a 14-year-old girl. Regardless of whether or not he was convicted, 21 video instances of himself engaged in sex with underage girls were removed from his home. We all know he forged documents to marry a 15-year-old Aaliyah, who he had been mentoring since she was 12. So we know what this man is about. And we as a community need to say, even if we can't put him in jail, we're not gonna give him our money anymore. We're not gonna financially support the lifestyle that we know that he's living. Um, and so I started that petition um, and then uh, Kenyette Tisha Barnes, 
uh, reached out to me when she saw me on the news and said, I have got to help. I, I've been doing this work, um, you know, and I want to I want to help. Um, and the two of us formed Mute R. Kelly um, and decided that not only were we going to try to get him off the radio, but we were going to try to get his cancer, his concerts canceled. Um, and we were going to try to get him off of streaming. We were going to make it impossible for other artists to want to work with him. We were going to cut off the money at every turn that we could, because it's really his money that is insulating him from the consequences of his crimes. And so if you stop the money, you stop his ability to hide. And so that's where Mute R. Kelly was born. I want to go to another clip from the docuseries Surviving R. Kelly. This is survivor Lisa Van Allen, followed by singer and former R. Kelly protege Sparkle. Sparkle's niece is allegedly the 14-year-old in the sex tape video for which R. Kelly uh, faced but was acquitted of child pornography charges. You know, I was kind of surprised when I actually ended up meeting him, because I just thought I'd be the last one he would try to talk to, because I was probably the youngest one there. Rob was sitting there at the pool, and he was being really, really nice, and he asked me how old I was, and I told him I was 17, and he asked me, will your mother let you come to Chicago? I knew he was at least 31, so I thought when I said 17 that he'd be like, you know, like, that was going to be the deal breaker. But um, it wasn't. Young girls are impressionable. Like, he's R. Kelly. Now, look who I got. Look who showing me interest. He's charismatic, funny, and he's an all-around nice guy. But Robert is a master manipulator. Like, everybody knows it now. They didn't know it back then. I'd heard about Rob's reputation, about him dating Aaliyah, but I didn't assume that he liked younger girls. I just thought, at that moment, I just thought he liked me. So that was Lisa Van Allen. And talk about the significance of this and Sparkle's niece, the person Sparkle, who was a singer with uh, Robert Kelly, with R. Kelly, um, uh, alleges is her niece. Yeah, um, I mean, that, it's such a hard documentary to watch, um, to see so many young women fall into this trap over and over again. Um, but, you know, Sparkle is absolutely right. Young women are very impressionable. Um, you know, and we say young women especially, but everyone is impressionable and is is able to be manipulated by somebody that they look up to, they admire, they worship. I think, you know, there are grown people right now who have a celebrity who, if that celebrity dropped out of the sky and shown their spotlight on, on them, you know, would leave their husbands, wives, children, go run off to, to L.A. tomorrow. So, you know, I think to, to think that children would be less susceptible to that type of temptation is ridiculous. Um, you know, he, he has honed his, his trap at this point. Um, when you hear all those lady stories, it's the exact same story over and over and over again. Um, he's using, um, you know, his charm, his, his looks, his fame, his money, his vulnerability, his bait. Um, and then he, he flips the script on them. Um, Arnike, so it's really this just is unfortunate. This is Geronda Pace from the documentary uh, Surviving mm -hmm. R. Kelly, who says, I mean, this is just an amazing story because she actually met him while she went to his trial almost every day. And he saw her as he was walking into court. She says she was 15 when she met Kelly. I went to his trial because I was a super fan at the time. I didn't believe he was guilty, and I didn't want to believe that he was guilty. I was a freshman in high school. He was old for me to like him, but I fell in love with his music. After Robert's trial, his friend sent me a message and invited me to R. Kelly's party. And in the middle of me texting him back, Rob, he actually called my phone. And he was telling me, he said, I remember you. And I said, well, what do you remember me from? He said, you came to my trial. Thank you for your support. I was shocked. I felt like I was on top of the world. That was survivor Geronda Pace, who alleges she was later sexually, mentally, and physically abused while living in a cult-like atmosphere in Kelly's home. Uh, Pace is now speaking out despite having received a cash settlement from R. Kelly in return for signing a non-disclosure agreement. And talk about, um, talk about, Arnike, these non-disclosure agreements. 
Well, I mean, that's how he's been able to kind of cover his tracks for years. Um, I, I, there's a lot of talk about, you know, women accepting these cash settlements, um, but not talk about him making these cash settlements. Part of it is, you know, when these cases come up, your lawyer takes a look at him and goes, you need to make this go away, right? This is not something we want out in the public. Um, and so he offers them money um, for their silence. Um, and I think that they are judged for that unfairly, um, because if, if we all think about our, our daughters, our nieces, um, the young people that we love in our life, would we want their name and their image and the uh, terribly humiliating things that have happened to them all over the news forever? Um, you know, women are forever um, judged and, um, and, and found guilty for any sexual indiscretion that they have for the rest of their lives. You know, at this point, Monica Lewinsky could cure cancer and we're, there's still gonna be a footnote on her legacy for something that happened decades ago. And who wants that for their child? Um, what you want is for the person to pay for what they did. Um, and if you're not able to get that in court for whatever reason, for statute of limitations, for lack of physical evidence, you wanna make them pay however you can. Um, and so many of these people took the cash settlement um, and the NDA to make it go away and to also save their daughters that humiliation of having their name dragged through the mud. I think if we wanna create a society where people don't take money and they, they fight it to court and they fight to get justice, we have to create a society where victims are not going to be blamed and judged for the things that happen to them. Um, we have to create a society where this is not gonna follow you for the rest of your life and be the defining moment of your childhood. We have to create a, a society where people actually look at the facts and the evidence and not at the fame and the wealth and the smoke screen um, that money and, and fame are able to create in order to really kind of um, see the, the merits of the case and judge it on that. Um, so, you know, so I don't judge any of these women for taking uh, money for their silence. Um, I, I don't know that I would be able to put myself in their position. Um, and they're extremely brave for coming out on this documentary and telling their most humiliating, degrading, um, you know, moment of their life to the entire world. Oh. Um, I don't know many of us who would want to do that. Or so, Nikkei um, I, I want to bring Angela Clary into this discussion, the mm -hmm. father of Esriel Clary, who met R. Kelly at the age of 17, moved in with him with hopes of advancing her music career. He hasn't seen his daughter in almost four years. Um, Angela, thanks so much for joining us from uh, Las Vegas. Can you talk about what has happened to Esriel, what you understand took place? Um, yes, I can, I, I think the situation with Azriel was, uh, more of a personal situation that the world don't really know about. Um, it was a lot going on with Azriel prior to meeting R. Kelly. And that's what led up to her being able to go to the show with us and had to be at the show with us for her to even attend the show. Um, moving right in, she never moved right in. Uh, we had a open conversation with R. Kelly after the event that uh, took place and we, uh, he gave her his phone number and um, they started talking, I think on a Sunday to each other. And on that Sunday, we had no I idea that they was texting and already starting a relationship that Monday She's supposed to have been in school. And then um, she, she wound up not being in, school, in class. So when we called, she drove to school. She, she always drove through high school. So she was, um, didn't report home at the right time. So I think uh, my wife called and then she called me and told me that uh, Az wasn't home. So I called my son who also went to school. And that's how we figured out she wasn't at school. We found out she uh, left school early. And then we blew up her phone, just kept calling, calling, calling. Uh, no answer. When we finally got our, uh, our answer from her phone, she sent the mother a text and said she had an audition with R. Kelly. Um, she had to leave school. She had to go over there and meet with him. So we was like baffled. So she told my wife that. My wife called me, said, hey, she at the hotel with, this, with R. Kelly. We need to get there. I leave work. She leave work. We wound up meeting at the uh, hotel in Kissimmee, Florida where we see his tour bus, my daughter car. We go in there, um, went to the registration, asked them for R. Kelly. Nobody uh, knew that where he was or 
he was under that name and they don't have a celebrity here, you know, they have to protect the celebrity. So we understood that. So we went in and started going door to door. Security was called, police was called um, for us disturbing the hotel. The security finally went up and found our daughter, went door to door, um, pulled the rooms. He had like a top floor with about seven, eight rooms and they found him and my daughter in the room together. Uh, we came down, they brought her down, some kind of way they didn't bring him down. And the next thing we asked uh, the officer there, where was R. Kelly? He was like, he spoke me on his way down, but he never came down. So we heard that he left, he went out the back door, or whatever, he was gone. Um, we was more concerned about our daughter at that time. We talked to her, asked her, you know, she, she put on this, this show for us. You know, hey, this is my career. Um, he called me, you know, this is what it was. So he, he asked me for audition. I was like, yeah, but we, you know, you only supposed to went without telling one of us, period. I mean, we already talked about who he was, his background on the way home. When she, when she told us that he gave her uh, his number after the show, when she went on stage and, and uh, sung for him. So, you know, after that, we talked to her, went home. And then, um, which we didn't know, that they had already uh, had a sexual intercourse that day. We find out a year later. Your daughter when, um, was 17 years old? She turned 18. She was 17 in Kissimmee. Uh, where do and, we have uh, to wrap up Kissimmee, this Florida. segment of our interview, Angelo? Uh, but we're going to do part two and put it online at democracynow.org. But you have said um, that um, you don't think this could continue if these children weren't black girls and young women, can you explain as we end with this comment? I, I, well, I think the comment was this straight blunt that if the, the, the females was, was Caucasian, this would have been, it wouldn't have been to this uh, amount of women or young girls kids or anything. It'll stop at one, maybe two tops. Um, I think in the black community that we want heroes and we so scared to demolish somebody because of the good they make us feel with whatever talent they have that we don't want to be the one to say, hey, we got to destroy them. And I think this is why it really drug on as long as it did. And he was so successful at getting away with People have no idea that there's two different men. That there's the person, Robert, there's the persona, R. Kelly. Go ahead on, break them off with a little previews of the remix. R. Kelly, widely regarded as the king of R&B, known for songs like Ignition. But his ex-wife, Drea Kelly, says lurking behind that Playboy image, there's a more sinister persona. Here I am, his principal dancer, choreographer, on stage, right next to him. And people have no idea that this man just beat me on the bus. People have no idea of the bruises I'm hiding. Drea claims she was a victim herself of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse at the hands of Robert Kelly. Did you ever fear for your life? Yes. You thought he might kill you? Yeah. Your kids? No. But me, definitely. Their tumultuous relationship initially began with a love for his music. Thawing and thawing video, there's a part in there where I'm dressed as a geisha. This is around the time when Matrix came out, so I put the Matrix move in the video. There she is, front and center, his wife of 13 years and mother to his three children. Why did you decide now? Summer of 2017 hits. All these allegations start coming out again, and I'm like, God, I don't think I can take this one. What do you make of his song, I Admit? That is the dumbest thing he's ever done. Because you didn't admit anything. That was the classic narcissistic response. The pair first met more than 20 years ago in their mutual hometown of Chicago. R. Kelly, at the time 27 years old, had just skyrocketed to number one with his breakout hit, Bump and Grind. He was about to embark on his first tour as a solo performer and was auditioning backup dancers. I remember I danced the paint off the walls. They started clapping and he was like, uh, you got the job. 
Just 19 years old, it was her dream gig. Andrea says she would quickly rise from backup to principal dancer and eventually choreographer. Shortly thereafter, she says her then boss would seek a more intimate relationship. I do remember when he said he fell in love. He said I was sitting on the back of the tour bus reading the Bible. He said, and you remind me of my mama. At this point, you hadn't seen any kind of indication that there may be any kind of violence or rudeness. No, but what I did see is a man was very controlling. R. Kelly would continue to climb the Billboard charts, soon becoming a household name with the release of this crossover mega hit. I believe I can fly. After I Believe I Could Fly, we were married, but at that point I had seen him go from just an all-black audience knowing who he was to now you're doing Space Jam, you're getting Grammy nods, winning Grammys. All right, Kelly, I believe I could fly. Oh, wow. At a certain point, your marriage started going down. When was that point? When I was pregnant with my first child, he locked me in a bathroom and I slept in a bathtub. Outwardly, Kelly was the portrait of a doting father cradling his baby girl Joanne in Celine Dion's I'm Your Angel. And even though they would go on to have two more children, Drea says their marriage was crumbling. And then in 2002... R. Kelly was charged today with 21 counts of child pornography. A tape emerges, purportedly showing R. Kelly engaged in sexual acts with a minor. When the videos surfaced and the allegations surfaced, uh, the child pornography charges, did you believe it? No. I'm thinking to myself, that's impossible. But again, he kept me very sheltered. Did some part of you have a nagging suspicion? I'm too busy dealing with my own abuse. If it's early in the morning. Around this time, R. Kelly would sit down for an interview with ABC News. People need to understand that R. Kelly is not who they think, but it's who I know, you know. I'm not perfect. He would face trial for multiple charges of child pornography and be acquitted on all counts. But at home, Drea says her husband grew more controlling and easily angered. There's no let's talk about it like a regular couple, you know? No, it's his way or the highway, period. It was a seemingly ordinary scenario that Drea claims led to her being attacked, restrained, and ultimately hogtied by Kelly. And he took the rope tight and he tied my arms behind my back and then he took my leg and he tied my legs and my hands and arms together and I just remember laying on the side of the bed crying like let me go just untie me let me go and he fell asleep with me on the side of the bed like an animal in 2005 you file this order of protection but then a few weeks later you withdraw it why'd you withdraw it Fear. He's a powerful man. At this time, he's at the top of his game. So now I get this order of protection and it dawns on you, this is not bulletproof. Eventually, she says a series of altercations while on vacation in Miami led to her breaking point when she almost tried to end her life. What happened there? What, what kept you? First, God put my kids. So I remember I climbed out on the balcony and I looked down and it was like God allowed me to see my body was laying in blood. And I prayed that God, okay, I need an answer and I need it now. And he told me to get my laptop of all things and type in domestic violence. I take the survey and of the 17 things on the list, Robert had already done 15. Drea says she was determined to leave, fleeing with her three children to her father's home in 2006, she filed for divorce. Have you thought about changing your last name? No. You don't mind the association still with being a Kelly? Well, when people say association, that's like a club or fraternity or whatever. I paid for my name in blood, sweat, and tears. Literally. Nobody knows what it was like to be Drea Kelly. Drea Kelly is strong. Drea Kelly is a survivor. Drea Kelly made it away from Robert Kelly. In response to the allegations made by Drea, R. Kelly's manager told ABC News they have no comment. When was the last time you did have contact with him? Oh, wow. so long ago, I can't even remember. Drea is now a full-time mom. 
Her three children, Joanne, Jai, and Robert, all live close by, just outside of Los Angeles. That is my world. I call them my eggs. If you go on any of my social media, everybody sees hashtag my eggs. Her eggs are now all grown up, from 16 to 21 years old. They are well aware about the headlines about their dad and say his past has sometimes led to them being bullied at school. How would you handle it when people might say something nasty to you? Um, I just, I know that it doesn't have anything to do with me. Do you all have any contact at all with your dad? No. No. Not me. And it's been a long time. Any message for dad at all? Hi. <laughs> oh, Margo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what now? What's next for you? Everything. <laughs> now to be able to fearlessly tell my story and to shout it from the mountaintops. Wow, that's... Words can't even describe that. At the end of the day, we don't have to keep talking about the storm. It's about how you come out of it. Drea has now become an advocate for victims of domestic abuse. The healing process is never ending. And I think that's the misconception that people think that, how did you heal from it? I'm healing every day. Do you like teenage girls? When you say teenage, how are we talking? Girls who are teenagers. 19? 19 and younger. I have some 19-year-old friends, but I don't like anybody illegal if that's what we're talking about, underage. Uh, everything that guy just says bullshit. Thank you. Uh huh. Some people think that you like underage girls. What do you say to them? Well, those people, those people that don't know Robert, they don't know me. Serious? The public outcry surrounding R&B artist R. Kelly continues to grow after more than a dozen women shared their harrowing stories of alleged controlling and abusive behavior. And tonight, two Baltimore women are accusing R. Kelly of sexually assaulting them after his concert in our city back in 1996. Young teens at the time, they snuck out to see their idol perform at the Baltimore Arena. And tonight, they are telling their story exclusively to WJZ. And in a major development, another Baltimore woman has come forward, a witness to what happened at a downtown hotel. You May 31st, 1996, R&B superstar R. Kelly's top secret tour storms the Baltimore arena. For best friends, 16-year-old Latrice Scaff and 15-year-old Rochelle Washington, it's the concert of their young lives. They're so excited they call into 92Q. They had us live all over the radio. People heard us all over the city. The concert ends, but the night is far from over. The girls have flyers for an after party at the Baltimore Grand Nightclub at Saratoga and Howard. They're living a dream. R. Kelly was scoping us out through a crowd. The women tell WJZ they are given marijuana and alcohol, then invited back to the hotel with R. Kelly. At what point did it turn from exciting and cool oh, you're with boy. R. Kelly to... Okay terror. He entered the room already exposing himself to us. Scared, Rochelle shut herself in the bathroom. That's when Latrice alleges R. Kelly sexually assaulted her, something she describes at a recent news conference. When Kelly was alone with me, he asked me to perform all sex on him. I was under the influence of marijuana and alcohol and I did it. He then had sexual intercourse with me, even though I did not have the capacity to consent. And in incredible development, a local woman saw that news conference and instantly recognized the women and their story. Sabrina. 23 years after Sabrina saw Latrice stumbling off the hotel elevator, these women are reunited for the first time with WJZ cameras rolling. An emotional, overwhelming moment. <laughs> knowing that together they will seek justice against R. Kelly. I've thought about them for many, many years. Did you know how old she was at that point? No, but I knew they were young. You could clearly see she was in pain. She was in pain. She couldn't walk. She was bent over 
walking alongside of the wall. And she began to tell me that um, she was in a room with R. Kelly and, you know, they had sex. It was very rough. And he left her on the bed and said he would come back. He never came back. Security came and told her Robert said meet him in the lobby. You can corroborate their story. I sure can. The fact that she's been waiting, waiting. For, for, you know, for us to do, you know, come forward. It's just, I just can't, I, I can't believe it. I'm just really shocked. Would you say what happened two decades ago still haunts you oh, today? Yes. I'm gonna be very honest. Like I wish that I knew what I knew now cause I would have done things different that mm -hmm. night. And I'm so like going in the bathroom, leaving my friend, I wish knowing now if I could go back that I would have said, let's just get out of here, you know? Don't touch her, you know. It's okay. Though. We were young, you know, we were young, so we weren't thinking like a, an adult would think, you know. We were kids back then, so. And like I said again, we were just happy and starstruck at that moment. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. And there was also alcohol and drugs. Right. Yeah, and we, were, we, were, um, we smoked marijuana and we were under the influence of alcohol. Yes. But you feel so. like that was given to you on yes. purpose. Yeah, they gave that yeah, to they, us. Yeah, uh -huh. they offered to us. It was part of right. what they did. Right. Yes. Do you remember, were there other people in the room with you? Hmm. It's two other men that was entering the room with us. And when we were one part of that night, um, I remember two times, um, the, either the manager or the producer was smoking and drinking with us. Did you feel in any way that they were going to help you get out of this situation oh, at all? No, I don't think they, no, no. It, it, it was more like they was more involved in the situation because like they never asked our ages. You could clearly see on the picture that we was minors, teenagers. So they never identified us, you know, what age we were or nothing like that. So they never asked how old you no, were? No, never asked. Even at, the, even at the Baltimore Grand where we had went to the after party, they never called us or nothing. They just took our money. And recently there have been allegations that the singer has been holding women under his spell, controlling their every move. Les Trent spoke exclusively with one of the women who says Kelly was living with Kelly was like being in a cult. R. Kelly is facing claims of holding at least six women against their will at his homes in Atlanta and Chicago, something he vehemently denies. Now in this exclusive interview, Kitty Jones says she was one of the women under R. Kelly's spell. You think he's a master manipulator? He could probably make you feel like you're wearing red today, Les, instead of blue. At 33, Kitty says she found herself in R. Kelly's web after she met him at a party in Dallas where she was a popular radio DJ. She was a big fan and was thrilled when he slipped her his number. I texted him and I said, this is Kitty, you just gave me your number. And then he said, always refer to me as daddy. Wait a minute, that was the first text he sent back yes. to you, referred to me as daddy? Yes. Soon, Kitty was joining R. Kelly on his tour. Here she is with him on stage in a cage. Here, he serenades her. Kitty started flying back and forth from her home in Dallas to Chicago to spend weekends with Kelly. That's when she says he began to exert control over everything she did, including telling her what to wear. When you come to see me, don't wear clothes like that. Meaning nothing remotely sexy that might attract other men. And he told her something else. I needed to stand up every time he walks in the room. No alarm bells went off in your head? Yes, they did. Even with what she already knew, Kitty quit her job and moved into a compound owned by R. Kelly in Chicago. There were other women living there as well, but she says they were forbidden to communicate with each other. They lived in separate suites. According to Kitty, it was virtually a prison. You had to ask to go to the bathroom, um, ask if you can order food. When a woman loves. She says R. Kelly would get physical if she did something he didn't like. The way that he would do me would maybe just slapping around. Um, I got tossed around on the ground, kicked, um, starved. Kitty says she was never held against her will, but after nine months, she says she got up the nerve to leave. In your words, what is going on in that circle 
I, a part of me is still scared to call it a cult, but that's definitely what it is. A cult. Yeah. What drove me to want to keep sharing my story was the fact that my silence made him more arrogant. We were all kind of afraid to come forward and talk about our stories. He knew that, so it kind of made his ego a little bigger to keep it going and going and going and going. And that's the reason he's gotten away with it, because we were all afraid. My name is Geronda Pace, and I was in a relationship with R. Kelly when I was 16 years old. I am Drea Kelly. I'm actually R. Kelly's ex-wife. My full name is Kitty Jones. I am an ex-girlfriend of Robert Kelly. My name is Angelo Clary. I'm the father of Azriel Clary. My daughter's currently still with R. Kelly. It wasn't an easy decision to participate in this documentary simply because I have children. I wear the hat of the victim, but I also wear the hat of a mother whose father is the man who is the center of this storm. Robert was controlling from what I would wear, when you would wear it, who could speak to me, like walking into the studio, literally the engineers had to look at their feet and he would let them know, don't look at my wife, don't look her in her face, there's no reason for you, look, he wouldn't let me speak to them. You shouldn't wear that. Um, did anyone talk to you on the way here? Don't look guys in the eye, don't speak to them. Look down, turn your face against the wall. Hummers used to be a thing that would trigger me because that was the first time that I really thought that man was going to kill me and it was in the backseat of a Hummer. So it would be a thing sometimes when Hummers would come by, I would shake, I would get nervous, I couldn't breathe because I thought this Hummer is gonna eventually be my casket, like he's gonna kill me in the back of this Hummer. The heated arguments was something that was a bit alarming. If I didn't want to do something, he would get extremely upset and it would become heated, then over time it progressed to, okay, now I'm not going to yell at her anymore, I'm going to slap her. So he would just slap me, and that was to, I don't want, I can't, I can't talk about it, it's just too hard. People think when you come forward, that's it. You're still dealing with living it. Every time you're describing incidents that happen, you're picturing yourself getting hit. You can feel that. You can smell his hand. You can remember the cologne that he was wearing that day. It's frightening. From me sitting and spending time with all the victims, I can assume what's happening because their stories tell me what my daughter's going through because she wouldn't be exception to the rule. And I can only pray that she's not having to go through half of the things that I've already heard. To have a man to take your 17-year-old child, stripper, from that young adulthood to not spend 18 home, 19 home, 20, and now we going on 21 with our family, that makes no sense to me. 30 years, that's the sentence for singer R. Kelly. When sentencing Kelly, the judge said, the public has to be protected from behaviors like this. The victims spoke about the sentence. I never thought that I would be here to see him be held accountable. I stand here very proud of my judicial system, very proud of my fellow survivors, and very pleased with the outcome. 30 years did he do this, and 30 years is what he got. Katie, does this send a message? Yes, it does. It, it sends a message to other survivors that, you know, this is a day and time that we're being heard and believed. The prosecution team says he avoided punishment for decades until today. R. Kelly is a predator, and as a result of our prosecution, he'll serve a long jail sentence for his crimes. Well, Mike and Ray, jurors shown 17 video clips that make up a pivotal portion of the government's case. Federal prosecutors contending that the videos clearly show R. Kelly engaging in illicit sex with a 14-year-old girl. But the courtroom proceedings unexpectedly halted for a time due to a degree of confusion and concern about the sensitive nature of the content. 
Defense attorneys, prosecutors, and the judge disagreeing for a time about how best to screen the graphic videos. Large black partitions moved into place in U.S. District Judge Harry Lenin Weber's courtroom, designed to shield the screening of the R. Kelly sex tapes from the public here in the courtroom. The reaction of jurors at the Dirksen Federal Building not visible to reporters due to the partitions, but the government alleging the tapes and key testimony make it clear that Kelly preyed on underage girls. I am surprised that you agreed to do it. Why are you sitting down with us today? I'm very tired of all of the uh, lies. I've been hearing things and, you know, and seeing things on the blogs and, you know, I'm just, I'm just tired. What are the lies that you're hearing that disturb you most? Oh my God. Um, all of them. Um, got little girls trapped in the basement, helicopters over my house, mm -hmm. um, trying to, um, rescue someone that doesn't need rescuing because they're not in my house. Handcuffing people, starving people. I have a harem, uh, what you call it, a, um, a coat. Mm -hmm. I don't even really know what a coat is, but I know I don't have one, you know. Mm -hmm. Have you done anything that you regret? Have you done anything wrong? Lots of things wrong when it comes to women that I apologize, but I apologize in those relationships at the time I was in the relationships. Have okay? you broken any laws when it comes to women? Absolutely not. The six-part series interviewed 50 people, mm -hmm. family members, your former tour manager, numerous women who all claim that you abused them. Yeah. Are you saying everybody in that documentary was not telling the truth about you? Everybody? If, if, if you really look at that documentary, which I'm sure you have, I have. everybody said something bad about me. Nobody said nothing good. Mm -hmm. They was describing Lucifer. I'm not Lucifer. I'm a man. I make mistakes, but I'm not a devil. And by no means am I a monster. I'm going to name the names. Andrea Kelly, your ex-wife. Kitty Jones. Mm -hmm. Lisa Van Allen. Lizette Martinez. Jerron DePace. Mm -hmm. Faith Rogers. Yeah. Asante McGee. You're saying everything they said in that documentary about you is not true. They are lying on me. Why would these women say the same thing about you, that you are controlling, that you are abusive, that you tell women when to eat, when to go to the bathroom, when they can sleep, where they can dress? Why would all these women tell these different stories about you if they were not true and they don't know each other? That defies logic to me. Right, right. Until you hear the explanation. You can start a rumor on a guy like me or a celebrity just like that. All you have to do is push a button on your phone and say, so-and-so did this to me, R. Kelly did this to me. And if you get any traction from that, if, you, if you're able to write a book from that, if you're able to get a, a, a reality show, then any girl that I had a relationship in the past that I, it just didn't work out, she can come and say the same exact thing. Are you blaming this on social media? I'm talking about the power of social media. Have you ever had sex no. with anyone under the age of 17? No. Never? No. I have to tell you, it's so hard to believe that based on all that there's, we've read. I'm going to tell you something, the Gail. There's one you. I'm going to tell you something. What women said about you. What women said about me. What women, so nobody's allowed to be mad at me and be yeah. scorned and, and lie on me. Mm -hmm. So they're lying on you. That's your explanation. They're lying on you. Absolutely. What? How stupid would I be to do that? I didn't say you That's were holding. That's stupid, guys. I didn't. Is this camera on me? <laughs> yes, it's on. That's stupid. Use your common sense. Don't forget the blogs. Forget how you feel about me. Hate me if you want to. Love me if you want. But just use your common sense. How stupid would it be for me to, with my crazy past and what I've been through, Oh, right now, I just think I need to be a monster and hold girls against their will, chain them up in my basement and, and don't let them eat and don't let them out unless they need some shoes down the street from their uncle. Robert, Stop it. Y'all quit playing. Quit playing. Robert. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. Y'all, I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this. I gave y'all 30 years of my career. Robert. Y'all trying to kill me? You killing me, man? This is not about music. I'm trying to have a relationship with my kids, and I can't do it. At this point, we briefly pause the interview to give Kelly a moment. 
His publicist helped calm him down. I need somebody to help me not have a big heart because my heart is so big. People betray me and I keep forgiving them. You sound like you're playing the victim here. You sound like R. Kelly, you do.